listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Well, happy, happy Monday, everyone. Yes, Monday can be happy. (laughs) Absolutely can. I am being closely monitored and supervised. Yes, he is. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Uh, If you're new here or you're just trying to figure out what we're all about, we try to give you a lot of information and have an enjoyable time doing it. You know, after all, it is supposed to be a happy thing when you talk about, you know, our creator, the Bible, and those kind of things. It's not supposed to be drudgery. So uh, hopefully, you know, check out givegodnani.com. I have not gotten the the link to the interview uh, that I did with Logan Crawford the other day, but as soon as I get that, I will put it up on the website, and it will probably be on uh, authorjerrymitchell.com as well. So check those out. Um, Don't forget the books. They're available. That's how we do what we do. Hopefully the advertisements are done. (laughs) I hope. Um, I'm going to look at something today that we often see when we're reading the Bible, but we don't give a lot of thought to it. And you'll see what I mean here in a minute. One of the things though that causes confusion when we read the Bible is not as much uh, what it says, but the way the translators and the uh, editors have chosen to write it. Because language evolves and the use of slang changes, the definitions of words that were written in 1611 King James may have a different meaning then than they do today. And also not having an understanding of the culture that's being written about uh, may imply something to us today that may have been very different in the past, right? You, You may have heard... Uh, a recent argument against the Bible that misuses the concept of payment for payment. You know, I've seen this on billboards. An eye for an eye causes the whole world to go blind. Well, really? (laughs) Is that what it's saying? Is that really what we're getting, what we're supposed to get from this? The passage was originally meant that equal payment is due when someone causes either a physical or even a, an emotional offense. So let's look at this in context just a little bit if you want to read that passage. Two men might be fighting. They might hit a pregnant woman so that the baby comes out, but there are no further injury. Then the man who caused the injury must pay money. He must pay what the woman's husband says and the court allows. But if there's further injury, then the punishment is that life must be paid for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It is also hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Exodus 21, verse 22 through 25. So what we see is the Creator demands payment for payment. Uh, This is found in the covenant that the mixed multitude agreed to at Mount Sinai. And while it is about punishment, it's more about making certain that the punishment fits the crime, right? Uh, And we see that in the next verse. A man might hit a male or female slave in the eye, and the eye might be blinded. Then the man is to free the slave and pay for the eye. Now, (laughs) slavery is another topic uh, that makes people upset. And, And some think, well, how can a... Yeah, I hear it too. I'm not sure what it is. How can a loving God, how how can a loving God approve slavery? Well, slavery at the time of Moses was pretty much voluntary. You know, if it wasn't forced kidnapping, uh, man stealing is forbidden. So a, a, a servant became a servant because that person was not able to provide for themselves, not able to provide for their family. So they went. They would agree to go to work for someone else, knowing that in a few years they'd have the chance to go free, right? Today, we call those people employees, at least in the United States. 
Now, getting back to the way that the Bible was translated, <laughs> um, what we see is amazing. The, we look at, at our English translations today, and I think this is true in other languages as well, but not every other language. So I, I need to clarify that. When the King James Version was first written, when they, when they first completed it, the king ordered it done, uh, it was first completed, there were no parentheses used at all. But some very astute readers who were able to read Hebrew, English, and Greek um, they soon realized that, wait a minute, this, this doesn't match. Something's goofy. Something's going on here. What's happening? And they complained. And so the, the writers got together and they went back and they said, okay, when we need to translate something or add a word for clarification, what we're going to do is we're going to show that we added something or completed a thought and we're going to put those in parentheses. So that's why you see parentheses in the King James. Later, other translations would kind of continue that, but instead of being more accurate, it led to more confusion because they included their own agendas in these parentheses. So the, the problem is, with it, though, in the King James, is that sometimes they would include an entire verse in parentheses when they only added one word to that verse, which was supposed to clarify that verse. I know that sounds confusing. So let, let's look at one that should be fairly uh, familiar. And not rather, as we be sen- slenderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let's us do evil that good may come. Whose de- demination is just, just Romans 3 verse 8. See how it can Confusing. confuse people? <laughs> now, the, this verse contains parentheses around, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say. But the only word that was actually added to the original would be the word that. The the original would read more accurately as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm, we say, let us do evil. Not a huge change, but a slight change. I think they could have made this much easier to read and in some translations it is, but words are picked by translators, editors, and um, remember the King James Version? The, the King James ordered the Bible to be rewritten, right? And if you um, wrote something the king didn't approve of, you probably didn't have a good day. So even though the the translators were the ones who were doing the work, if the king didn't approve it, it didn't get in. (laughs) All right? (laughs) Different translators, different translations, choose to add sometimes much more to verses so that they can promote their own agenda. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I don't care because it needs to be said. Here is a good example from the New International Version. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Mark chapter 7, verse 19. Uh Uh-oh, we have a problem here, right? The parentheses around in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean, is not in any, and I mean any, of the original manuscripts. 
It implies that Jesus had the authority to change the sacred word of the Creator. But what do we read in John 7, 16, when Yeshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If we choose to believe that Yeshua Jesus was sent by the Creator, and our Creator will not change, remember Malachi 3, 6, then Jesus has no authority to change the Father's original words because to do so would be, by biblical definition, blasphemy. And if that happened, if that occurred, he could not be who we say he is, right? A man named John Wycliffe lived uh, from 1330 to 1384, and he was actually the first person to translate the Bible into English about a hundred years before uh, William Tyndale offered his translation. Now, the King James uh, translators in 1611 used a lot of Tyndale's translation in their work for King James. Um, Tyndale didn't get to finish his translation, though. Okay, uh, Tyndale was writing his translation under the or I should say, at the time of Henry VIII. And uh, Henry VIII decided Tyndale had violated uh, canon, biblical canon law because the only acceptable translation, according to Henry VIII, was into Latin. So Tyndale actually met a very gruesome death before he could finish. Um, when the King James translator revised their work, to include parentheses. It is about 233 places where they had either changed or added to the original manuscripts they were working with. The Textus Receptus was the manuscript they referred to, and later uh, Westcott and Hort would come along when they found the uh, Sionicus and Vianicus manuscripts. They really liked those, and... Basically, they came out and said that the Textus Receptus was villainous and vile, but we'll get to that another time, unless, of course, you'd like to read Inheriting Lies. It's in there. <clears throat> sometimes the use of parentheses is helpful, and sometimes it gets in the way, especially when something is added that shouldn't be there, uh, like the Mark 7 verse. One place the parentheses is actually helpful is in Hebrews 7.21. King James uh, completely changes the original, but it does make it somewhat easier to understand who is saying what they're saying. I hope that made sense. Um, because to read it in the original, if you don't understand Greek, it's completely weird. <laughs> so, you know, when you see these things, you have to be careful. The King James Bible I use is filled with notes I've made over many, many years of comparing uh, that translation to the original. So many notes, in fact, I, I had to start using a different method. I've got three notebooks now uh, that are basically cross-references where it goes back to, to the original and, and who's saying what and that kind of thing. And I'm going over all of this to say, when you study the Bible, don't guess at it. Don't guess at what it says. Compare the translation you're using to either other English or, or other translations in your language. And if you're able to, compare that to the original. It just makes it so much better when you can say, why did they put that in there? Why is that in my Bible? That wasn't in the original. I can't find that anywhere. When you start doing that, guess what happens? You become a student, not only of language, but of culture. You become a student of Scripture. Um, a good interlinear Bible, either hard copy or one that's online, that's available, and there are some free ones out there, References that I refer to often, right? Ronald Reagan quoted a Russian proverb many years ago. And the proverb is, trust but verify. 
And that is absolutely crucial when we're studying the Bible. We need to have some amount of trust in the translators and editors that they were attempting to provide a sound Bible translation. But we also need to remember they're human, right? They're human. It is absolutely possible for them to have a desire to promote their own agenda. Or, in the version, in the King James Version, <clears throat> King James Agenda. If you've ever read the preface to the King James Bible, you'll know what I mean. And if you haven't read it, take some time to read it. It's worthwhile. The original was a lot longer than what we have today. I think it was like three pages long. But it was their way of saying, uh, we did the best we could in the circumstances we had. <laughs> that's, that's the short version of it, okay? I have often said, and you'll hear me repeat this quite often, that in its original language and in its original context, the Bible is agonizingly specific. And that is absolutely true. However, when you translate anything out of its original, meaning can be lost. A, a literal translation can be dangerous, too. Um, if you think about a literal translation of, you know, that's a really cool book. You should read that. If you literally translate it into Spanish, it would say, that's a very cold book. You should read it. Now, who wants to hold and read a cold book, right? So context is important. Culture plays a role. You know, if, if you don't understand the culture you're reading about, you're going to miss some things, right? For instance, how many times have we heard that women were considered second-class people in the Bible? Oh, you know, God is just so terrible. He treats women so poorly. Well, have you ever read Proverbs 31? You get an entirely different point of view. Women weren't second-class citizens. That comes from later, after the Babylonian exile. That comes from culture, not from the Creator. Look at the time frame of the passage you're reading about. You know, the Bible covers a lot of years, Right? Six, well, 4,000 years of history, because it stops about 2,000 years ago. So culture, time frame, everything is important. Cultures are influenced by other cultures. Certainly the, the Jews and the Hebrew people influenced the, the people around them, the other nations around them. But they were also influenced, especially during the exile. People change. People change for the same reason cultures change, right? People are influenced by the people around them. As believers, you should be influencing the people around you and not be influenced by them. I wasn't going to go here, but I mean, I, I don't have a choice but to, to go here. A lot of people are talking about the opening ceremony for the Olympics the other day. And I heard a very, very good commentary from Sky News. And the commentary basically said the homosexual community wants to be accepted. They want Christians to accept them. But attacking them the way they attack them during the ceremony, all it does is drive that wedge a little deeper. Because now, especially conservative Christians are saying, see, all you want to do is ruin us. All you want to do is take us over. All you want to do is make fun of the things we hold most dear and sacred. I liked that commentary because it actually displays the hypocrisy that some of these folks have. Not all of them. But some do. Uh, I also uh, read something from one of the, the homosexual groups that said it was absolutely terrible what they did. And they blamed it, believe it or not, on the French being the French. 
<laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's all around. Was it appropriate? Not in that setting whatsoever. Is it appropriate uh, maybe among certain groups of satire? Maybe. Maybe. You know, I can think of a lot of Saturday Night Live skits that were very, very... Uh, uh, what's a good word to use here? They weren't exactly offensive, but they were making fun of other groups. But it was for that particular culture that watched that show. And yes, I used to watch it because sometimes it was funny. Sometimes it aggravated me to no end, but sometimes they had some really good points, right? And if you can't laugh at yourself, you you know, you're you're you're... If if you are so offended by everything that you can't laugh at your own misgivings and mistakes, more power to you. You're a better person than I am because I do some dumb stuff sometimes and I have to shake my head and say, that was really stupid. You have to have that humility to be able to laugh at yourself. But when another group attacks not only Christians, think of, think about what the backlash would have been if they would have attacked the Islam faith. What, w- what would have happened, especially in France? It would not have been a good day. It would not have been a good day. So understanding culture, understanding history, understanding the times when things happen is key when we're reading. We have to know, we have to know the, the, not only what's being said and make sure it's accurate, but we also need to know when it was said, what was happening at the time. Is this dealing with something political? Is it dealing with something uh, from one of the monarchs? Is it dealing with people? Is it dealing with the creator? What's going on in what, what we're reading? All of these things, the use of parentheses in Scripture can be helpful. It can be detrimental. That's why it is so important when you're reading and you come across these things, you have to stop right where you're at. You have to think about what's going on. You have to verify what you just read. Make a decision and move on. And while we're, we're on that, I want to say something about the chapter and verse markings. Okay, verses, I don't, you know, verse markings, I don't have a problem with. Chapters, I do. Because sometimes chapters interrupt a phrase or a thought or what's happening. And you have to keep reading. You can't stop just because it's a different chapter. You have to keep going. Because if you don't keep going, you're not going to get the complete thought. You're not going to get that complete understanding that you need to have. So don't be intimidated by chapters. Just keep reading. It's all good. Read the whole thing. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> right? You know, cultures change. People change. But the sacred word of our Creator does not change because just like Him, He is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. Don't don't guess at what it says. If you're interested enough, if you're concerned enough to read it to begin with, don't guess at what it says. Trust it, but verify you know, I know that not every English-speaking person is going to be able to look at a Hebrew passage and understand it. But we have the tools and the technology today, and these tools are available often free online. And you can compare verse for verse, word for word often. Don't overlook. The, the things that we have today that, that make this, I won't say easy, but a lot more accessible.
it's it's that important. It really is that important. So until Thursday. Thursday. We do wish you many, many blessings, everyone. Absolutely. 